And Global Affairs Analyst Sam Fateh joins me now from Washington, D.C. as we take a look at the implications of this development. Good to have you join us. My pleasure. So for a while now, we have been seeing a train of revelations, um, whether it is the, uh, uh, the, the Panama Papers, um, the Paradise Papers, and now the Pandora Papers. Talk to us about what stands out for you um, with the Pandora Papers. Well, nothing quite critical. Maybe the only thing is this paper seems to be more focused on world leaders, head of state, head of governments, politicians. It seems to be the main focal point of this particular investigation. Obviously, with the other papers, um, like the Paradise Papers, for example, we saw a lot more of like businessmen, influential and well-connected people in the globe, you know, being uh, their financial uh, uh, um, siphoning of funds and how they invest and how where and their money goes uh, being investigated. But this particular paper pays a lot of attention to the people at the top account of government. And it talks about, you know, tax avoidance and, and shell companies. Does this sort of suggest to you that there, there are two global financial systems in the world? One for the rich who can get away with almost anything and another for the poor who cannot? Well, you know, when laws are created, laws create loopholes in which one can take advantages of those loopholes. They may seem morally wrong, but when it comes to legal... The the legal part of it, it would it would not be legally wrong, okay? Then we go and go into all the philosophical debate about what's moral and what's legal or not. However, you know what one thing that is particularly concerning about the revelations in these papers is that when you look at leaders who come from what is classified as third world countries or very poor countries, you know, owning luxury apartments and uh, um, uh, uh, pretty much avoiding taxes in their own nation, and they still claim to care about these countries, and then they are also taking out millions and millions and millions of dollars out of their nations that could have otherwise been used to take care of, of certain critical things like, like healthcare and providing better education to their citizens, then it raises the question of how much do they care? And in fact, where are some of these funds coming from? Because most of these politicians that they are showing probably do not have that kind of investment before they went into politics. And even their current salaries right now and their bonuses and other allowances that they get is not adequate enough, even if they've been there for 15 years or more, it's not adequate enough to gather the kind of wealth that they uh, that they have today to buy some of these luxury apartments. And the other question becomes a question of about integrity. If these funds were legally acquired, then why didn't they outright buy them instead of using cell companies to buy to buy them? It raises the question as to what exactly are they hiding. Do you, you, what you just said seemed, seemed quite complicated and complex. Is that perhaps why it is so difficult to clamp down on these individuals and companies? Well, what, is, what makes it difficult to clamp down on them is the loopholes within the law. I, I, one thing we have to remember is that we live in a capitalist uh, 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 economy for the most part. When, when most countries want to progress, they, 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 they have to take you know, capit capitalist uh, uh, approaches. And the countries in which they are uh, like Panama or even um, uh, the Cayman Islands and others, okay, smaller countries probably do not have the natural resources and the human capital in order to generate enough money to develop their countries or to keep their economies afloat. So they create laws which allow, allow them to become tax havens. They create laws which allow people to register companies in these countries and have less regulations and rules to follow. We have seen that with the shipping industry, for example, a lot of uh, 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 ship uh, boats that are registered for, uh, to ship containers are not maybe U.S. companies or English companies, and then they, but they register in uh, um, in countries like Seychelles or they will register in the Cayman Islands and some other countries where they will they will face. Um, uh, less rules and regulations and they have to follow those rules and regulations in international waters instead of following that of the US or, or, or England or Germany. So they, these countries also have to survive. So that legal context, I mean, again, makes it okay for them to do this. However, the first thing you learn in economics is that human beings are self-centered individuals. And we may say, no, we are not, but that's what we are. And so these leaders and Often rich people will look for more ways in order to generate more income or more money without paying a lot of taxes. And legally, they have been protected by doing this. So it's going to be very difficult to clamp down on this.
Mm. And the UK is also seen as, as a, a tax haven for, for some of these individuals and companies. Uh, it, it, wouldn't it sound hypocritical when some of these countries say um, you need to fight corruption in your country, but in, in these other countries, you are a tax haven to um, this money money is being laundered, whether it is illegal or legal? You know what? Like, like, like I said, when, you, when, when we talk about the UK, when we talk about uh, some of these countries that are like tax havens and countries that a lot of people are in, uh, um, uh, investing in, I, to me, it boils down to one thing, national interest. That's what they care about. I mean, for example, if you look at Switzerland, uh, it, it, the UK become a non-starter. Like, it does, that's the minor issue. Okay, a lot of illegally illegal wealth is is, is, is is in Swiss and is developing that country. So it's about what their national interest is. Mm. For all of these and, and Sam, sorry to, sorry to jump in. in, and that's what I was talking about when I said, isn't it quite hypocritical when you say um, fight corruption in your country, and yet uh, some of these monies are being um, laundered and kept in these countries that are saying fight, fight corruption in your country. If perhaps, for example, the UK isn't a tax haven for some of these monies, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be easier to fight corruption in a country, for example, like Nigeria? In fact, I would not call it hypocritical. It's very, very selfish. However, possibly, maybe, the leaders of these countries that are taking the money out of the hands of their people and taking it to the UK for UK to develop their own for, for their country and the detriment of your own people are the folks that should be ashamed of themselves. And this is why we need to end political apathy and educate our people, especially in Africa, about what their responsibilities are, for them to understand that we vote in these leaders, we give them the power. Power doesn't belong to them. We give them the power, we give them the authority. So if they are doing this, we need to get them out of that position. It's like we have the ability to fire them. That is the first thing and the most important thing that people should understand, whether you live in the Gambia or Nigeria or anywhere in the world you are. Unfortunately, in the part of the world where we come from, which is Africa in particular, what we do is when people become politicians and they become rich and wealthy, we tend to follow them. We tend to beg them for stuff, not realizing the fact that we gave them that job. Until we understand that government itself is a business and the stakeholders and shareholders in this business is us, the electorates, then we will have a long way to go. If you're a shareholder in a company and you do not get your dividends like you want, you withdraw or you fire your CEO. The president of any country is like a CEO. If he cannot get you your dividend as a country, when, when, and when I talk about dividend, I'm I'm talking about good healthcare, good infrastructure, um, good quality education that would allow us to kind of, to have the kind of workforce that would develop our country, the kind of workforce that would allow us to compete globally for jobs. Then you fire that CEO and you fire that president by ensuring that the next time when we vote, we don't vote on tribal lines, we don't vote on, on, on what region we are from, we vote on competence and we vote on policies that matter for the greater good of any nation. That's the first thing we have to mind. Mm. And I, I hope, you know, with what you just said in the coming days, because this has almost been a lot of people have been mute about this. We'll see whether this becomes an echo. Thank you so much for talking to us. Global Affairs Analyst Sam Fati. My pleasure.